Hello, my name is Terry, and welcome to the Goblin Hideout, the NFT finance podcast. I'm once again joined by my co-host, Ryan, and today we welcome Han Wen, the founder of Voyage. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, happy to have you here. So Voyage is a protocol that provides BN uh, buy now, pay later services. Um, Han Wen, um, super pumped you're here. Maybe you can do a quick introduction about yourself. Uh, what got you into crypto? And maybe like really what interested you to really just dive in? Thanks, Terry and Ryan. Really happy to be here. Uh, so I got into crypto in 2016. Uh, I was just delving into what uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum is doing then and really got into working within the industry in 2017 as a part-timer, just doing community management. Um, that's really during the ICO booms um, because there was quite a lot of funding during then. And uh, I thought it's quite interesting to just um, dive into it. And I went full time in 2018 uh, when I got the opportunity to join a layer one blockchain for Zilliqa. Um, so uh, my mentor was like Amrit Kumar, and he was teaching me all the the inner workings of how a blockchain works, and um, also give me an access to to a, a fund which I could use to develop grants, accelerator programs, and even the investment fund which I handled. Um, to the end of my service there in 2021. So that was a quite run, rough rundown of what I did over time. And uh, last year is also the time where I started ideating things together with my co-founder, which is Ian. And uh, we decided to just dive into um, the industry as uh, co-founders to, to develop a loan protocol for NFT finance. And uh, we decided to make BNPL, our focus, because we think that uh, loan services that is directly catered towards the retail side is uh, something that we want to endeavor in. So so what got you like fully interested in NFT finance? How did that come on your radar? Were you um, were you like a, you know, DGEN with NFTs, uh, you know, in your spare time or um, how did that come to fruition? Yeah, um, on that part, I started going into DeFi in 2021. Uh, that was during the summer where it's kind of like the, the NFT summer, uh, sorry, the, the DeFi summer and so on. And during the time, I started exploring different kinds of DeFi primitives. So they are basic Uniswap, Aave, Compound, and uh, even Frax Finance, and uh, Curve Wars, and so on and so forth. So that, that was the time where I got really interested in um, how smart contracts could revolutionize finance in, in a transparent format and uh, wanted to develop something of my own. And I also have this problem, which um, NFTs itself is too expensive for me to buy most of the time. I rather commit my capital in trading where I can earn some yield sometimes. And um, most of the time, you just have your capital stuck into a 10 ETH NFT and I just wouldn't want to buy it directly. So essentially this is kind of dog footing my, um, that my own protocol where I kind of want to buy NFTs using PNPR as a service. So if I pay by installment, I know that every month I can just generate that amount of cash flow and can pay down installment and just own the NFT at the end of it. So that's, that's really the drive um, for myself personally because I want to buy NFTs without committing too much capital. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, something that I've also experienced myself. Um, so I think this is a perfect segue into, um, you know, you potentially providing a Alice and Bob example of how Voyage works. Right. Okay. So um, with the retail users, for example, let's say we call it, call it Alice, they will want to borrow money and they will go to uh, our reserve pool to do so. So how they actually trigger the transaction is that they have to pay down the first installment, and the rest of the fund that's required will be drawn down from the reserve pool, and uh, that will be um, funded towards the purchase of uh, NFT in the single transaction. And uh, that's, that's essentially the, the, the loan process. 
And over time, they have to repay the debt you know, in the installment format. So every 30 days, there's one installment they have to pay down. And uh, over, if they complete all the three repayments successfully, then they will get to own the NFT and redeem it um, within their own vault. So they will get to own, own the assets at the end of which. Um, and for Bob Wise, I guess you could call him a lender. He will be just lending directly to the pool, which Alice will draw down from. And uh, that um, Bob as a lender himself will, will be just uh, permissionally entering that pool, just like how they did with Aave and Compound, or let's say Ribbon. And they have two options to choose from. There is a senior trunch and a junior trunch. Um, senior being uh, less risk involved and junior being more risk involved. Uh, I would just dive more into what the difference kind of tranches is um, and how uh, what kind of risk profile they will be in at a later stage yeah absolutely um, but before we get into the tranches I did have a couple questions about the protocol mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost who would you say are your core users um, or your desired users who wants to use this for what reason great great question so for us, we are catering for retail users that does. So it's not really the DGEN kind of profiles that we're looking at, but uh, the wider audience, uh, which are NFT collectors themselves, which uh, people might not have, uh, who do not have ETH at that moment, but they might have it in the future. So it could come from their own salary. It could come from their own trading profits or somewhere else, any kind of venues where they can generate cash flow. And the way that we create and uh, structure this product is also uh, in that uh, catered towards that profile of people, um, that kind of demographics. Because uh, in our UX wise, we we do cater for guestless transactions. So there's meta transactions is that's involved. You don't have to care about gas. And um, we also make it so that uh, the vault itself handles custody for the NFTs also. So you can restrict the movement of NFTs and prevent yourself from getting attacked by phishing attacks and so on. So yeah, that's kind of the profiles that we're looking for. Got it. And for these customers, what's, what's important to them? Like what matters to them in terms of UX, in terms of feature sets that Voyage provides? Right. So for them, um, I think the most important thing is that they could manage all their assets and their bills, payments, and the debt directly within the application. So um, there's also a requirement to send them reminders so that they will not be late for repayments and so, so that um, they can successfully repay everything in, in time. And the last thing is that they, we need to cater for um, top-ups. So they have to have a way to on-ramp directly within the application itself, which we, we will build as well. Um, such, such as using uh, providers like Ramp and MoonPay. So I think for the, this users-wise, uh, what they would expect of us is a full-fledged wallet um, that functions very similar to Argent, but it's catered more for the NFT collectors. So the wallet UX-wise will just be very much focused on displaying NFTs and uh, making sure that you will repay your bills. Got it. And maybe this is something I missed, but in this scenario, how do you prevent users from, say, irresponsibly buying NFTs with borrowed money? Right. So each user's account will have a credit limit and it's a credit limit per collections that we whitelist. So the, there's a maximum amount of credit they can draw down from the, um, the entire account. And that will we set arbitrarily at the beginning because we do not know what the user's profile is, is as we want to cater for all kinds of anons. And uh, that limit that we are artificially setting on is $10,000 roughly. And uh, that is very much in sync with what the, the different kind of credit cards providers actually provides. And beyond that, then once they build up their own credit profiles um, by doing repayments with their vaults, we will be able to give them a higher credit limit. So we use a lock uh, kind of a calculation to do so. 
So, um, Hanwen, maybe you can talk about, I guess, at a high level, the vault architecture, and maybe walk through the rationale for implementing the EIP four six two six within the vaults. Yep, makes sense. So, um, this this is four six two six is more for the lender side where they will be able to um, deposit into the different tranche and get a tokenized version of the vault. Um, so essentially that, that, that tokenized version of their deposits um, make it so that it's more composable with other DeFi primitives um, and protocols. For example, let's say Arvin Compound. If um, we use uh, permissionless lending protocols out there, they could potentially use that as a collateral to borrow money. Um, it's just that uh, whether we are whitelisted as, as a collateral in this lending platforms. So it's, it's more of a composability thing that we decided to implement for 626. It's actually developed by the Rary developer um, Transmission 11. So uh, we think it's a very good uh, example of uh, composability. And it's actually used by uh, the Ribbon Finance, if I'm not wrong. So you can you can use um, the REF, which is their uh, core option vault, to um, to just deposit into fuse and borrow USDC. If I'm not wrong. How do um, how do withdrawals work within the vault? Yeah. So like so someone, yeah, I guess like someone deposits uh, collateral, um, and then yeah, yeah. If you just walk through like the withdrawal process, that'd be great. So on the lender side, when they deposit, it would be what the pool is lending out. And in this case, it's if, if itself. And um, the withdrawal portion will require a cool down um, just, to, just to cater for um, like uh, the, uh, whether there's any liquidity issues. Because we, we do foresee there will be issues if let's say the utilization spikes up and the borrower side is still borrowing and the lender's side will not be able to withdraw um, because there's just insufficient liquidity that's available. Um, so that's why we kind of implement a flat kind of cooldown mechanism well, where you have to wait 14 days for your withdrawals to come back and to, act- to be activated. Um, so when you activate your withdrawal process, uh, we will just make sure that um, those liquidity that's coming in back from the repayment side will not be lent out anymore. And those um, liquidity that, that will be coming in will be guaranteed for the lender side to withdraw. So within the vaults, how do you determine, uh, how is the utilization rate determined? And then also what is, um, I know you have a term in there, optimal utilization rate. How is that calculated? Right. Uh, at this moment, it's actually arbitrary. Uh, we have uh, 85%. So, so from 0 to 85% is a flat rate. Um, so we, we make sure that the borrower side will just pay uh, roughly 24% um, interest for, for whatever um, what they are borrowing on. And after 85% utilization rate, then we start to ramp up the interest rate. Um, it's a linear ramp. And uh, we will activate another ramp, another version of ramp at ninety five percent. So this is uh, is a double ramp in this sense, and this function very similarly to what you see in Alpha Finance, where uh, we took we took a lot of lessons from, where basically the double ramp mechanism just ensure that uh, there's always sufficient liquidity on the lender side to redraw, because the borrower will stop uh, will start to repay or the future borrowers was, will not want to draw down a new loan because of the high interest. So is utilization also, uh, I mean, would that in the future maybe be determined in, in part by like the volatility of the collateral? We do not use the volatility of collateral to determine the utilize, optimal utilization rate at the moment. Um, okay. Will you guys be using something like that in the future? I think it's something that we can explore um, to to do so. 
but that, it definitely complicates the entire process because um, the realized volatility it's it's not really a best indicator for for um, for us to utilize in in the I mean even for options right you are using implied volatility to price all these things so and there's not really a good implied volatility kind of indicator for NFTs itself so I I would say that maybe it's not time yet to explore something like that but in future probably we can do so uh, there there are a few if I'm not wrong you interviewed some someone previously that was some doing uh, options protocol for NFT I think we can probably use those kind of primitives in future to do so that makes sense and then as far as um the assets that you guys um, are comfortable having in the vaults right now, how do you, how are you determining the uh, allow list? And then um, is that like a process uh, through governance? Um, right. So for this part, we, we decided to um, do it ourselves at the moment. And uh, governance is probably down the line when, if let's say we have a token, um, but we are not planning to do so. At the moment, so it's um, decided by our team. We have an arbitrary list of things that are criteria that we we wish to see within an NF NFT collection before we decide to whitelist it. So it could be something like uh, more than one hundred ETH daily volume on average uh, is uh, traded for more than three months. So we can use the realized volatility to kind of make some kind of back testing. And uh, there's also things that we do on the other side, which is due diligence to see whether the NFT will not rock so that we don't we think that we, we know that it not goes to zero in the next day or so after they, the um, people draw down the loan and purchase it. So there's there's a few other step process that we do take into consideration, but it's mostly um, determined by using uh, marketing market data that's available, like trading volume and uh, realized volatility. That makes sense. And um, I, I guess what, what um, in the future, uh, when governance becomes a larger part of uh, uh, Voyage, what, what, um, what type of features do you see like governance having control over, like the cool down period potentially on liquidations or um, anything else that comes to mind potentially? I think it would just do um, the determination of fees and uh, of cooldowns. And of us, um, if let's say we have a token, we probably do liquidity mining for each of the different pools. And in that case, uh, also the different allocations um, for the different pools in, in terms of the emission. So we try not to allow... I think it's best not to allow governance to determine the, the risk parameters because there could be a malicious activity that happens. Let's say um, the protocol becomes big and the, the price of the market, the, the market cap of the token is low and they could just overtake the governance and set it, the liquidation criteria to, to extremely uh, high and they, they you just liquidate all the assets that, that's out there. So it's probably not the best to use governance for that kind of uh, um, permissions, I think. So I, I think this is a, a nice segue. You, you have a um, tranching model as well uh, for the vaults. Um, I would assume that would governance have any control over those parameters? But first, um, maybe you can walk us through at a high level the tranching model. Makes sense. So for the tranching model, we split the different pools into senior and junior. So on the senior side, it's used to lend out to borrowers. And the junior side is used to insure the, the senior. So it's not lent out to borrowers in this case. Um, if you think of it uh, in, in, in the sense, uh, it will be that is, the senior side is uh, roughly protected from downside by um, the junior site, which is which is twenty percent of the the weightage, so it's uh, roughly fifty percent of the downside, and the senior uh, junior site will be protected by roughly thirty percent, which is because of the first installment. So yeah, that's a rough breakdown of the different pools, and 
um, the senior pool, because of the less risk that's involved, they get less of the interest payment. And, um, and so they will be roughly getting 12% interest APR. And for the junior side, because of the more risk that's involved and because of the smaller pool size, they get roughly uh, 60% interest APY, APR. So that's the, that's the difference between the risk profiles and um, the, the interest that is being paid to the different pools. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. I do want to pivot a little bit and ask you generally about the future in the market. How does Voyage think about bootstrapping either users and or depositors um, into the protocol? And what's in store for the future for Voyage? That makes sense. So for this question, I think we will be offering one of the most, most competitive if interests out there in the market for the senior tranche. So essentially, most of the blue chips itself, you look at the 30 days rolling uh, kind of volatility, it, they, they, they don't dip below um, more than 50% over 30 days. And um, th that has been quite established data for the past six months or so. So I would say for that side, the risk for a depositor is pretty low. And getting 12% on if is quite unheard of, except for options protocol, where it can, which can offer you much more. But as core options where there's risk involved, which is higher, in my opinion. And for the junior side, it's more for, uh, I would say, DGENs that are long a certain NFT. So in this case, it's very similar to uh, uh, all the money put options protocol, but for NFTs. And the you that you're getting for and getting rewarded for it's it's very similar in this in the same sense. So essentially for DGENs, betting on the NFTs will only go up for that period of time. Um we'll be quite hopeful to use our protocol in that sense because it's in in some sense you will not be able or you will not lose your principal. Um, if if you think that the, the NFT will just keep going up. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, and just to wrap it up, what is your viewpoint on the future of the NFT finance market? How do you think it will develop? I think for NFT finance wise, VNPL is probably something that uh, a lot of people are doing right now because it's it's almost similar to under collateralized lending. And uh, it allows users to kind of leverage themselves in, 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 in that sense and uh, gain the capital to, to obtain certain assets um, without actually having that um, over collateralized you know, kind of lending profile, which usually what um, NFT finance is currently, currently catering for. And uh, with that, we'll probably see more credit scores that's being built up within the entire ecosystem uh, among all competitors. And that credit score could be used um, to further the interests of other NFT, uh, DeFi protocols, such as Maple Finance, if they wish to lend to retail in future, they probably can do so because uh, you can just use the repayment history of this kind of um, protocols to, to judge whether that person is credit worthy or not. And uh, I think this kind of, credit profiles and will eventually establish itself as a decentralized identity uh, where you could use it um, to just kind of verify yourself uh, and, and met pretty much access anything that uh, is on the DeFi and NFT marketplaces. So Han Wen, um, I think to close it out, um, how can uh, listeners get in touch with Voyage and um, you know, do you have like a telegram they can follow or a, a discord they can follow or, um, Twitter and, um, how can, um, how can people get involved? Right. So our website is voyage.finance. Uh, so most of our details and materials are located there and to join our community, just go to discord.gg slash voyage. And you can enter our community and talk to us about our protocol 
and we will start to whitelist people to gain access to our beta. So we are going to do an invite code base uh, beta access for our for our wallet, and we hope to see more and more people um, get on board and start to use the BNPL service uh, that we provide. And we hope to see more and more collectors uh, start to own NFTs without committing too much in an in, in upfront. Get whitelisted? Do they just go on the Discord and there's going to be a, a channel in there for that? or? Right. So no, that's just go on to general and start having some activities there. And uh, down the line, we will start to announce more things uh, that will be involved. So... Um, yeah, we 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 we'll, we we'll do more announcements when the activity starts to ramp up. Awesome, we really appreciate you having uh, having you on, and um, look forward to staying in touch with Voyage in the future. Right, thank you for having me, and it's a great opportunity coming here. And really, a fan of your podcasts. Follow me on Twitter. I'm zero x tete ho ho on Twitter. Uh, that's tay with an e, and you can follow Ryan at underscore helmets. Yeah, and that's uh, underscore H-E-L-M-A-S-S. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll, uh, we'll catch you soon.